National Geographic Sparkskins is based on the 2016 novel by Annie Prue. I'm Gold Derby's Riley Chow here with Elwood Reed, who adapted the book into this limited series. Now, the novel is noted for its environmental themes. So can you, can you talk about translating that into the show, and also kind of writing toward a social message? I mean, it's funny, as a writer, I'm always nervous about messaging or giving messages to people. Um, uh, one of the things I focused on in the book, and the book has 700 pages to arrive at this, uh, her thesis statement, um, was that what she, what she depicted in the book and the same thing we do in the show is, you know, civilizations and advancement of people is always at the cost of the have-nots and the environment. Um, so, you know, it was very easy to show you the group of people that were trying to settle this land and, and just their the mentality they had towards the landscape and towards the, the First Nations people that were there. They were they viewed them all as resources which could be exploited and used to their own gain. Um, and as a, I guess maybe it comes from my background as a novelist, I'm just a little bit nervous about sort of like putting big flashing things. Like I, I don't think anyone's going to tune in to watch a show about deforestation. I, I would not. Um, but uh, that's ultimately where civilizations end up. They end up exploiting the places um, where they spring up. And so uh, this is the genesis. This is the tide pool of humanity that, uh, that, that, and these characters that are trying to survive uh, and trying to make their fortune. And, and as if the show goes on, you'll begin to see how that translates into, you know, what, what the resources of the land, how they're used and utilized and exploited, and how the, the people that are there um, uh, are used in the same way. Now, how did you decide to focus just on the first 100, 150 pages of the novel, as opposed to kind of doing a big epic miniseries where it's kind of broken down by episode? Uh, again, as a, as a novelist, I always know that the, the impetus to write any kind of book is usually evident in the first 50 to 100 pages. That's where you're, it's not, it's not, that's where you're really laying down the themes that are going to sort of propel you through the rest of the book. And so, and that's particularly true of Annie's book. When you read it, there's these just captivating characters. And a lot of the original sin that then echoes throughout the uh, century, you know, through the centuries and decades in her book, it's all played out in the first 100 pages. And I had to add some characters and some story elements to sort of make it move along for television. But the character of Trepigny and Melisande and Duque and Cell, um, particularly the character of Trepigny is played by David Thewlis jumped off to me as like, I've not seen this character on television. So it was an easy decision for me. And, you know, I toyed with the idea of jumping around, like each season could jump a hundred years or 50 years and, and tell a different part of the story with the relatives or the, you know, the, the descendants of these people. Um, but I had such an amazing cast and I didn't, I was really loath to, you know, once you lay that story track down for these characters and these actors just to then throw that away next season. Uh, I, I was just getting going with these characters, and uh, I think that first 100 pages of the book, that's where the gold is, and uh, that's where a lot of events happen, and, and I focused on that solely. So this show, or uh, this uh, story was optioned four years ago by Scott Rudin, so I'm wondering mm -hmm. how you came on board and why they went with you. <laughs> well, I mean, Scott Rudin sold the book to National Geographic, and Carolyn Bernstein, who's an executive at National Geographic, I worked with her on a show called The Bridge, which we did at FX, and Carolyn was my executive there. So there's a, you know, at least for me, there's a level of fondness and familiarity with working with her. I knew um, that she was going to let me explore the things that are interesting to me, the weirdness, the violence, um, the pushed language. Um, and, and the book, you know, they gave it to me, and they said, we, uh, we don't know if this is adaptable. It's just, you know, if you look at this book on its, on its outside, it's a 700-page book that, that tracks, you know, multiple generations of characters throughout the centuries. Um, that, that's hard to translate to television, but there was a tone and a theme in there, like I said in the mm -hmm. first 100 pages, that I was captivated by. And, you know, when, when Scott Rudin's name is thrown into the mix, you pay, I, I pay attention. Um, and so it just had a lot of elements for me that I liked. It was an, an author that I loved. It was Scott Rudin, who's uh, a producer that I've always admired. He's made some of my favorite movies, and he's, you know, got notoriously amazing taste. And, and, then, and then National Geographic, which was trying to push into original scripted programming and the support of, of like I said, my friend who I've worked with before, she's just telling me, go, go do whatever you want to do. Go, go push this. 
that as a writer, you don't get that very often. Um, so I knew it was an opportunity I had to take. I talked to you, David Thewlis last week, and he said that uh, his character's religion was actually a part of the novel that ended up being cut, but you were able to bring into the show once you had talked to Annie Proof. So I'm wondering if there are any other examples like that of kind of scrap storylines that you're able to bring back in here with the broader focus. No, it was interesting because like when you adapt someone's book, and, and like I've had my books adapted, I've adapted other people's stuff. You, you know, the engagement with the author sometimes, the author like doesn't want you to change a word or they, you know, they're, they're, they, they have all these rules and what you can and cannot do. Annie was very hands off. I, I pursued her. I wanted to talk to her. And, you know, she was, she wasn't the most forthcoming person when it came to the book. And I understand that because when you write a book, you said what you had to say and you've moved on to the next thing. And she's probably sick of that book after spending five years writing it or whatever it was. So, but I, I was captivated by this character of Trepigny and I couldn't understand what he was doing there. He had all these mysteries surrounding him. And so she confessed to me one time over a phone call and email, I can't remember which one, that Trepigny was a Cathar and she had all this stuff about him being a Cathar and a dualist, which was a, a offshoot sect of the Catholic Church, which was rooted out in the Inquisitions and exterminated. Um, and, and, and it wasn't, maybe it existed in the book in like a ghost form that was just resonant there. But when I heard that, I was like, oh, my God, that's awesome. That's a really unique character trait. And so I jumped into Catharism there. Um, and she, you know, she, she told me the reason for it was edited out of the book is the book was already 700 pages long. She had to sweat it down a little bit. And, and so she took that stuff out. But, again, I could feel it there. And it was, a, it was for me, it was a hook uh, into the character. Um, but as far as anything else goes, no, I, I just, again, I tried to absorb the, the, the immensity of her book and the tone of it. And go, how can I, when I create new characters and new situations, how can I kind of like circle back to those themes that she had? You know, which is, I, I, and again, I'm, this is not themes that she told me. These are things that I took from the book. The rape of the land, you know, the, 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 the people that come there to seek their fortunes and how they make those fortunes on the back of the land and on the back of the people, the lesser, the, the have-nots. Um, that's there in the book. She never says it in the thesis statement, but it's there. And so um, I always try to circle my stories around those themes. Trippany is played by David Thewlis, and the show also has Marcia K. Harden, Zell McLaren, uh, Matthew Lillard, but the rest of the cast I was actually not familiar with. So I'm wondering, you know, from watching the dailies and uh, seeing how this cast interacts, uh, who are you really looking forward to seeing kind of break out in the next few years? Well, you know, it's funny. I mean, you get Marcia K. Harden and David Thewlis, that's a no, but David Thewlis and Marcia Gay are actors I've admired for a long time, and I mean, I never thought I'd get a chance to work with them. And then and to see them bring my writing to life was a, you know, a fucking honor. Um, but on the other side, there was a couple actors I had been tracking. I was aware of a Niren uh, who plays Gomes. And uh, I had seen his work. And I thought he was a really interesting actor that, that, for me, his slinky weirdness hadn't been utilized in the way that I, I, I just saw him you know, in, in, some, in some movies. He was in, Dun in, uh, in uh, Dunkirk, of course. Um, but he, he, there was something interesting about him. And so he took the character in a different direction. Thomas Wright, I worked with on the bridge. He's an actor I, I think is criminally underrated. Nobody knows. Um, I, 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 he's one of my favorite. He's one of the first persons that I gave the script to. And he and I have a deep, deep working relationship. And, and I trust him implicitly. I, I said to him, so who do you want to play in here? And he, you know, had this great pitch for playing Cook. And I think he's, you know, super magnetic. And Christian Cook... Um, had read the script and pursued me. Uh, and, and when an actor, you know, and I knew Christian's work, I'd seen him in, in, in some things, but when an actor pursues you, not because not he wants the payday, but because he likes the character in the world, I knew that he was going to bring something. And that was a really hard role because he doesn't have a lot of dialogue, but he's the center of the show. He's the moral center of the show. Um, and I trusted Christian to go on that journey with me. And James Blur is an actor that was new to me, uh, Complete Discovery. He plays Duque, um, and, and my pitch to, I definitely wanted someone to play Duque that was not well known, because Duque, ultimately, if the series goes on, becomes this, becomes this sort of antagonist of the entire series, um, and he really rises to this position of power, but I didn't want you to know who he was when you first saw him, and Tallulah Haddon um, came in in an audition in period costume, and she looked like she does in the TV show, and I was just captivated by her thing. I'm very excited for her chances. Um, people are going to 
you can't stop watching her and you see her. Um, and the same with um, Lily Sullivan. Uh, I'd seen her at the, uh, uh, the uh, it was the, uh, I, I always mess up the name, the, the Australian from the remake. And, and I thought she was a super fascinating actor and, and someone who could kind of make the shift of the character. And then, you know, of course, you've got David Wilmont and Zahn McLaren. And those are, I mean, Zahn, to me, is an extremely underrated actor. And every single thing he's always been in, I just look at him, I go, I'd watch a whole TV show with Zahn. Um, and then David Wilmont, of course, is, if you watch the show, you know, it almost steals the whole damn thing. Um, he's just one of those characters. He's that guy. You watch him, you go, who the hell is that guy? And you look him up and... You know, I just, my cast, um, for my casting directors was killer. And I had this, I think once you get David Thewlis and Marsha, it makes a lot of other actors pay attention. And, and I had the embarrassment of riches when it came to casting. And then, you know, uh, Dio, who plays Marie, was, um, she was not, uh, we, had, we, had, we had cast someone else in the role, and then we ended up recasting to Dio. And she was an actress I'd seen in a little tiny part um, in this movie, and I thought she was really interesting, and I did not know she was Mohawk. Anymore. And when I found out she was a Mohawk, I was like, oh my God, this is perfect for, for the show. So there's a lot of things came together in the cast, and I, I, I always like, you know, breaking new actors. That's a really exciting thing as a showrunner. Can you talk about uh, keeping this cast for future seasons. Uh, how long would you like the show to run? How many seasons, I guess? <laughs> well, you know, if you'd asked me that question five years ago, I'd say forever. But I, I've come to the point in my career where I watched too many shows um, that have worn out their welcome. And I think that the mistake you make as a writer is when you when you try to pace yourself for ten seasons, and you think that's. I just don't think in this current culture we have that we have that luxury. I think you've got to smoke them if you got them. Um, so you know, four to five seasons. To me, I could tell this complete story. I, I certainly have the expansion to tell a lot of story, but you know, I wanted to keep that immediacy. I, I, I get impatient when I watch shows and I go, oh, that episode's just marking time and setting up. And, and you know, I, I love the television shows like Ozark um, that just burn through plot. I think you can do both really well. Um, and in this cast, they can do anything I ask them to do. And, and, and I think the storylines, you know, stories should be finite you know, in, in the way that a book is. I, I think this idea that they can go on forever, that's not this world. That's not, I'm not doing a cop show or a medical show where they could, you know, be on for 20 seasons and nothing wrong with that. That's just, that's not the way the show was ever built. I'm going to tell you a beginning, middle, and end story. And this is the, this thing is the first chapter of the story. So the show's coming out very quickly, uh, very suddenly, uh, whereas mm -hmm. I understand the original plan was to have it more in November. So I'm wondering, uh, did that really affect post-production, or did you have it kind of already in a can? Well, it was funny because I had, you know, along with my studio partners, we had agreed to an accelerated post-schedule, which it's good and it's bad. You, you always want to sit with the edits longer, and, you know, if you give me time to rewrite or re-edit something, I'll, I'll do it until you pry it from my cold hands. But I had agreed to a, a more accelerated post schedule for no particular reason, just because I wanted to move on to some other projects I have uh, working on. And knowing that the show was going to debut in the fall and that I'd worry about it in the fall. Um, but we got in the last, we were working that last week as they were shutting down Los Angeles, finishing the score and finishing the, um, uh, some of the stuff on the show. And then when the opportunity came up to co go early, you know, part of me said, well, I'd love to have them properly promote this and you know, and, and, and have a lot of lead time. But I really, really believed in the show, and I really wanted people to see it. And I, I, a lot of me said, fuck it, you know, let's, let, let's, let's go for it. Let's, let's, you know, let's get it out there. I was excited about it um, uh, to show people, and, and uh, I didn't really want to wait till the fall. But um, so when the opportunity came up, I, I took it. And, uh, you know, it was something I think Nat Geo really wanted me to do. And uh, I guess they've been amazing partners. So, you know, I was like, sure, let's do it. Part of the reason is that uh, Nat Geo can now push this for uh, the current Emmys that will, they're mm -hmm. supposed to happen in 2020. Uh, so for mm -hmm. the Emmys, they're entering it as a limited series. Uh, why is that instead of entering it in drama, since it sounds like it's going to be going on with the same character? Well, I, mean, I, okay. I should say, I, I don't know that the show is going to go on multiple seasons, but you know, I just think in the current business we're in right now, you don't know. Um, and the show works both. It works as a limited and it works as a continuing series, but you just don't know, you know, with where our current environment is right now, 
what, what the future is. And there's so much programming out there you don't know. So, um, and I think, you know, part of the, and again, I'm not, I, awards are not my focus when I'm writing something. I'm just trying to think of, you know, what's the best way for the show to live. Uh, and, and I think getting people to kind of tune in and go, I'm going to tell you one big ripping story here um, is, is, is sort of like the thing that I've embraced with, with the limited series campaign. Um, but would the, you know, would the show go on? It's certainly designed to go forward. And would I love it to? Yeah, but I mean, who knows what the way television is working these days, you know, what, what the future holds. And finally, uh, what episode or episodes are you submitting for consideration in the writing category? Uh, I believe the first two or maybe the first one and the last one. Again, um, I'm not the, I know this is probably, you know, heretical. I, 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 I just, I don't, I don't pay that much attention to awards because um, they're so out of your control. And, and they're not, again, they're not why I write anything. I write something to, to be true to the characters and be true to the story and, and entertain myself. So um, I, I think I left it to the people at Nat Geo to choose which episodes to pick. But I mean, there's a very, very big continuity. Um, I, I wrote every script, so, and I had a I had writer's room that helped me, you know, with each episode, but like, you'll see a very continuous voice and tone throughout the series. Um, and I knew that going in, it would have to be that way because the bar that Annie Prue's novel sets, I thought that I had to adapt a tone and a language that felt, novelistic's the wrong word, but felt pushed and heightened and then maintain that bar throughout. And so, um, to me, uh, I think it's all of a piece, all the episodes are, like they're, and, and you know, just the only thing that changes is the escalating action, of course. But the writing, you know, I've made a very conscious effort, um, even at the script level, um, to write in the margins. And what I mean by that is not just the dialogue, but the description. I, I was trying to set the actors, my production team, my director, my cinematographer back in that era. And I was very focused in the visuals and even in the script, like, you know, trying to push them there. So, you know, I stand by every episode we did. I'm, I'm incredibly proud of the whole thing. And it feels, again, I had a lot of time to write it. So I felt like I was putting the whole thing out there at once. Like, this is, this is one big story I'm going to tell you. All right, Elwood. Well, thanks very much for chatting. I have many more questions, but we don't have any time. So our viewers will just have to check out the show if they want to learn more. And check out our YouTube channel where you can find interviews with David Thewlis and Marcia K. Harden. Thank you. Thank you. It was awesome.